this morning really is uh, how we process tests and trials in our lives and uh, where they take us and what our options are. So uh, I think you'll find that, uh, that this ought to touch every one of us in the room here. Because as one of my mentors has said to me um, years ago, and he keeps saying it, he said, life is either, you're either just going into a trial, you've just come out of one, or you're about to go in one. So, you know, life is kind of a series of, uh, of having the rug pulled out from under you here and there, and having things hit your life that, that you have to respond to. And uh, I just am curious, how many of you guys sitting here today, cancer has touched your family in some way? I'm just curious. Look, look around, look around. I'd say pretty much every hand in the room. Uh, you know, I think it kind of leads the way in the fearful diseases that uh, have assaulted our culture and our society. And, uh, but it doesn't have to be uh, something that incapacitates you. And uh, cancer may not be the issue for a lot of us in here, but passing the tests that come your way is the issue. And so uh, we want to address that today. But before I get started with that, I had three very, very, very special people that are here uh, at my invitation. Um, that, uh, that just blessed me beyond measure that I want to recognize and introduce to you. One is Dr. Mark Ireland. He's my primary care physician. Mark, can you stand up? <laughs> Dr. Michael Green, he's my thoracic surgeon. Mike, where are you? There he is. And Dr. Dan Hammond, who's been a personal friend for many years and told me on this trip after I had a bug bite that I was probably had 50 years or less to live. <laughs> he was one of my first medical encouragers, you know, it was great. But the reason I invited these gentlemen to come is because uh, I wanted to say right up front, there, there is no conflict at all between the way God uses the medical world and he uses the faith world uh, to work together. In fact, uh, most smart doctors realize that their skills uh, are not something they got themselves. Uh, that, that it was God-given stuff, and they realized that the talent and the gifting they have is, is something that they have been given to serve humanity with. And so uh, I've been blessed to have a medical team around me that understands where I'm coming from. In fact, when I met every one of these guys, I told them what, you know, how I was approaching uh, this battle with cancer, was that I was asking God to put the best medical people around my life and that uh, I was going to get as much prayer and as much spiritual support as I could in, uh, in dealing with this. And uh, particularly in the case of Mark and Mike, uh, God used them in, in intervention because uh, uh, Mark was the first one who caught the pathology reports that, uh, that showed me with stage 3 lung cancer. And he acted so quickly within, within about 15 minutes or so of him reading the report that came a few days after I was released from the hospital in October. He had me on the way to an oncologist. So uh, I am deeply grateful for that man who uh, was picked up on an email from the hospital and acted immediately. And then Mike Green, when he was doing a, a, the surgery on me to help me with the fluid buildup in my lung, he's inside my body with a camera, you know, one of those little space machines. And he was able to detect the, uh, the aggressiveness of the cancer that was going on and, and able to consult with my oncologist to dial up the treatment, you know. So these two guys that are here, uh, that have been part of this treatment process, uh, I really do. Bless you guys. Bless you guys. You know, so it's working together. It's working together. And just to give you a little bit of the story, uh, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but I thought my life was hunky-dory and great. Uh, all summer long, we've been, we went to Alaska, we were doing all our stuff, camping, riding a motorcycle in the mountains, pastoring the church, being a grandpa to 10 grandkids. You know, life didn't have any complications physically for me, hitting the gym three or four times a week, riding my mountain bike. Life was good. End of September, I'm out with some of our men doing, uh, doing a, uh, a donation pickup for one of the thrift stores over in Melbourne, and suddenly I can't breathe. I mean, I'm like gripped with, I mean, it just came out of nowhere. I had to sit under the tree. And it took me about 20 minutes or so to catch my breath. And I had all this chest pain. 
And one of our guys was with us who had had major heart surgery stuff. And he said, Larry, there's something going on. Maybe you need to get to your doctor's office. So being a stubborn man that wasn't going to accept that, I waited a couple days. Then I called Dr. Ireland up and told him what my symptoms were. He said, go to the ER. You know? <laughs> so I show up at the ER on the 2nd of October. Um, another quick blessing. I turned 65 in August, and I got a, uh, a Medicare Advantage plan yeah. put together after that. Uh, I know I don't look that old, I know. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but get this. My medical plan with Medicare and its Advantage plan kicked in in one October. Two October, I'm in the emergency room. So even the provision, uh, you know, and since then, with two hospital stays that run the tab up to over a quarter of a million dollars, the, the Medicare Advantage plan and all that stuff was, was in place, other than my hospital co-pays. God's taking care of all the bills. So, so that's a blessing, you know, just the timing of that. But as you can imagine, when you're just, everything's fine, and then suddenly you have a diagnosis of stage three lung. And I didn't know what that meant, really. Because until you face an illness, and I'm sure you guys have, have faced different things, you know, you're talking to one another and you mention conditions, and people around you who have not had that medical issue don't even know what you're talking about. It's a whole new vocabulary. So I'm learning a new vocabulary related to cancer, related to malignancies, and related to what do these conditions mean. It didn't take long for it to settle in that the kind of cancer I had was terminal, that there's no cure for it. And so um, I suddenly went from a nice, healthy human being to a man who's trying to face life and death in a whole new level. And um, that's a sobering time. You know, I went through every emotion known to mankind, which is pretty normal. Uh, why me? Uh, what's this all about? What did I ever do to deserve this? And, and uh, how am I going to get through this? And anger. And then the thought of, you know, my wife and four kids and ten grandkids. And have I prepared for my family? Are they going to be okay? I mean, all these things that begin to bombard your mind. Uh, and then somewhere in that early emotional swirl, I knew I had to settle some things. I knew I had to determine who's really in charge of my life. And I think for men, one of the hardest things, guys, for us to face in life is that we're really not in control. We want to be. Our culture tells us we should be. Um, for most of us, our training whether it's been military, whether it's higher education, technical, you know, we have been oriented to a culture that tells us we're men, we're strong, we're in charge. And uh, we, we develop that, and we, we tend to carry that over into our expression of faith as well. So uh, I imagine most of you guys in this room here, you, you attend church somewhere. I think I saw the hands go up for that. Um, so most of you in this room have some degree be it developed or minuscule, of faith. You have some faith perspective on life. Am I, am I accurate to say that? But it's entangled, it's entangled in a worldview and a mindset that our culture has given us that tells us we're in charge. Now that, that, that creates some real tension in growing in your walk with Christ. Because uh, best I can tell from reading the Bible, Jesus is in charge. And, and, and he's really not left any room that I've found in, on any page of Scripture to say, by the way, you can share my throne. We can rule the world together, you know? Just come on up, you know? He's not saying that to us. He's saying from Genesis to Revelation, he's the prime mover in everything. And so when you face a trial you are suddenly faced with how are you going to deal with something that really is out of your control. You could be a man's man and have been in control of your life for 40 years or 50 years. Your, your job could be a, a, a beautiful litany of success stories of how you turn companies around, how you turn departments around, how, how you led men in combat, how you, how you did things that were honorable, you were good leaders, you, uh, you got merits, you got recognition in different phases in your life. But you come to a trial like cancer, and you have a doctor walk into the room with a white coat on and tell you, uh, here's what you've got. 
And here's what this means. And uh, I've been grateful to have good, good physicians around me. In fact, I was talking to my oncologist. He's the only one that couldn't make it today because he had a prior commitment. But he gave me permission to, uh, to quote him on some things. But um, he said he stopped telling his patients all the statistics because of the ridiculous amount of fear it put in people. You know, like, well, here, you've got this cancer, and 50% uh, of the people with your condition will live two years. 90% uh, of the people will die within three years. You know, he doesn't do that anymore. He said when he first started his practice, he would do things like that because, you know, they, they sort of learned that in medical school about, okay, here's this disease, here are the statistics, and now they've got enough statistics on this stuff to be able to tell you, well, if you've got this, then here's your chances. How many of you heard stuff like that? And, uh, and I don't know, I don't think any of you guys that are in the room here have done this to me, but I've had at least a half a dozen or more well-meaning people come up to me in the last three or four months and say, oh, Larry, we're so sorry you're dealing with this. My brother-in-law died of lung cancer. <laughs> he had the same exact condition you did, and he died. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Brother, thank you so very much. You have, you have encouraged me today. Are you going to help me plan my funeral now? You know? I mean, it's like, I mean, people mean well, but they don't have a clue what to say. They really don't. And, and, and most people don't even know how to react to a friend or a family member or someone who's dealing with a life-threatening illness. They really don't. You know, you want to try to say something that sounds intelligent, but most of the time we miss it. Um, so I, I've had bizarre things said to me. I've had some in the extreme faith community that have, that have said, you know, oh, you don't go to the doctors, don't do this, don't do that, just believe, 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 believe. I had some people that have kind of ridiculed me for in, including a medical team in my, in my process. You know, I've had others that have wanted to send me to the best medical places in the world, um, you know, to, to try to, to fight this. And then I've had some beautiful, beautiful people uh, who realize it all has to work together. It all has to work together. But um, so what do you do, guys? What do you do personally when something hits your life that, uh, that you really can't control? I mean, money's not going to control it. Your uh, personality can't control it. Uh, your leadership position can't control it. I mean, here you are. It's out of control. you got to determine at that point, where are you going? Who are you going to talk to? Uh, what source are you going to try to tap into um, that's going to give you some hope and give you some encouragement? And um, this is where your faith comes in. And, and this is where good theology is important to have. And here's the basis of good theology. Who's in charge of the world? That's a good place to start. Who's really in charge of things? Is it random? Is it chaotic? Is it, you know, two rocks smashed together in the universe a trillion years ago and spit out an, an intelligent civilization and, and a developed uh, world? You know, or is there a God who's really in charge? And then you've got to deal with the issue of why did he let this happen to me? You can get angry with God about that. But you know what I found? He can handle my emotions. I was pretty mad at him, really. And uh, I actually had people come up to me and say, my, one of my own kids came up to me and said, Dad, what did you ever do to deserve this? And I said, didn't I tell you how I lived before I got saved? You know? <laughs> Don't you remember me telling you that I was a drug dealer and a rock and roll musician and sold dope on the street corner? Don't you remember who I was? You know, I said, I got plenty of reasons why he could hammer me, but that's not who he is. You know, you read the book of Job and you realize nothing gets to one of God's boys without his permission. That's not saying he's beating us over the head with anything. But if you remember that early part of the book of Job, which uh, Job's got to be a more interesting book for me in the last four months. And this is fresh stuff I'm sharing with you guys. I'm talking October 2013 is when this journey started for me. So I'm in a four month process. I'm halfway through uh, six rounds of chemo. And to the glory of God, I've had no side effects. And that's the prayer side, because I've had, I've had our prayer teams pray that, the, that the, what the medical folks are doing would target infection, disease, and malignancy, 
but it would leave my immune system alone. So every time I go and they, they run the full blood counts, and I say to my oncologist, what's the blood count telling you? And he's saying, well, the, the, the treatment is not affecting your immune system. Your red and white blood cells are staying where they're supposed to. That's a miracle. That's right. Because everything I've, as a, as a pastor, dealing with people going through this a lot, I mean, I've seen people who the, the treatment kills them. The disease doesn't kill them, the treatment kills them. I mean, it's, 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 just, it's just ugly stuff. But, but I, I've seen the hand of God in this. So I had to settle it pretty early on. Okay, I'm not getting beat up by God, but he is in charge. So if he's in charge, then what do I need to be able to tap into that he has to offer that's going to get me through this? And what I found is that um, he's adequate to handle things like this. He can pull us into a place where we can actually trust that he's in charge of our lives. Now, here's what's happened to me in the last four months. Um, I've been a Christian for 39 years. You, know, you heard me say I got saved out of the drug culture in the early 70s. Um, had, a, uh, had a radical, really a radical conversion experience. I mean, I went from a, you know, a rock and roll drug guy to a saved man who you know, got sober and uh, started taking care of his family and started living right. I mean, that happened pretty quick in my life, 39 years ago. Um, so I've been walking with the Lord for that many years to one degree or another. Uh, I've been in full-time Christian ministry for about 30 years. So, so you know, I, I've had some experience walking with this thing, but nothing that even comes close to what the last four months have done for me. I've known the scriptures from the early days that say to live the Christian life, you have to surrender. That's a big word, by the way. Big word. Um, and I thought I'd done that at different levels. You know, you can surrender at different levels, like, like Lord, I'm giving you my life. Lord, uh, uh, I'll have a quiet time every day. I'll read my Bible every day. I'll, I'll pray. I'll go to church. I'll give. I'll, I'll, be, I'll participate in the men's group. I'll volunteer. I'll feed the poor. I'll do stuff. You know, we have levels of surrender, levels of commitment, but yet at the same time, gentlemen, we maintain that final right to be in charge of everything. You know, we'll tell God, you know, you're in my life, don't want to go to hell, love to go to heaven, so I'm going to give you some parameters to work with, but whether we actually verbalize it or not, we stay in the position of control. Most of us do. Even if we try to spiritualize our lives by our good works and say, well, I do so much good, the good outweighs the bad, and so uh, I, I must be consecrated, I must be surrendered. Look at all the good stuff. I actually had a man years ago who um, moved out of our area who had been a very wonderful guy, actually, a tremendous. Every, every church would love to have 100 volunteers like this guy because he would do everything. But before he moved out of the area, he gave me a letter and he wanted me to read it on a Sunday morning of all the things he'd done. You know, and I, I kind of scratched my head a little bit and I said, wait a minute, what's the point of that? And he wanted people to know what a good guy he was. And so I look at stuff like that and I think, man, there's a lot of people who have the wrong perception of what God's really after. He's not after the merit list. He's not after 15 good points on one side of the clipboard, you know, versus five bad points on the other side of the clipboard. He's after your heart. He's going for the seat of your life. He's going for the throne room. He wants to be large and in charge. That's what God wants. And, and I thought I was there to a certain level. But I got to tell you guys something. Cancer is killing me in a good sense. I have been dying for the last three or four months to a man who's trying to hold on to stuff. And I have been little by little incrementally over the last four months saying, God, can't handle this. I'm giving this to you. I can't take this. I'm giving this to you. And somewhere in the process of dying to me more, surrendering more, yielding more, I came up with finding some of those verses that I knew like, I am crucified 
with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Suddenly, it's not my life. It's his life in me. And somewhere in the last four months, that exchange has taken on a new level. And I have been flooded with how much he loves me. I mean to tell you guys, I mean, I'm, I'm crying more than I've ever cried in my life. I sit in my chair at home, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm reading my Bible, and I just have to stop and just say, oh, God, you love me. You love me so much that you, you, have, you have pulled me out of a self-life to another degree. You have shown me dimensions of, of the cross, dimensions of being a follower of Jesus that, that I could talk about, that I could, I could lecture on, but weren't real in my life. You have shown me that, that the cross represents the deepest love that our Creator could have for us. That everything that would bring me to fulfillment and purpose and joy and contentment in life, he satisfied on the cross. And that, that his own death was so I wouldn't have to die in punishment for sin, in punishment for things in my life. He died in my place. But the only way it works for me is for me to identify with his death and give him the keys, give him the, put him in the driver's seat. And so God has used this nasty disease, and it's nasty. I mean, when you study cellular, at the cellular level what cancer does, it looks like spiritual warfare, and it is. I mean, you see these cells that can hide in your body and cover themselves with protein shields, and your immune system is chomping around like the, you know, like the little, uh, uh, Pac-Man thing trying to, trying to eat the bad guys and it goes right by him because it doesn't recognize him as bad guys. So then, you know, so then you, you get some kind of drug in your body and, and the drug eats everything. Good guys, bad guys, everything in between, manufacturing system, you know, and your body gets weakened and then the cancer cells sneak back around again. Chop, 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 and then they devour you at another level. And then that drug doesn't work. And then you go back to your doctor and he goes, well, they're not responding to this now. We're going to have to dial your recipe up. And then some other drug that will eat more of your body. I mean, tell me that's not wicked. Tell me that's not an evil, insidious, uh, tormenting kind of a condition that uh, couldn't possibly have its design anywhere than hell. You go back to the fall of man, you go back to Genesis, and you look, look when, when, when that all was released on the earth, when, when death was released on the earth, disease was released on the earth. And you realize that, that we're, we're at, really at a war with disease as, as God's people. And, uh, and, and when I realized that, I thought, man, this is a battle. This isn't just a battle for me. This is a battle that I need to understand to help other people. Because at the, at the cellular level, guys, we are fighting to stay alive. Every man in this room. You don't have any idea what's inside your body. But at the cellular level, there are good guys and there are bad guys. And they are fighting inside of you. And uh, whether they're cancer cells, whether they're, you know, whatever the condition is. And when we realize that this battle is going on at the cellular level, just like it's going on in the spirit world, um, it changes everything. But I'm telling you, the resources of God are adequate to deal with everything you're going to face. And there's a few scriptures I want to I share with us this morning. Because um, when this thing started for me, um, I mean, I had to go, I had to really dig in. But even before I got into the Word... I had the revelation of how much he loved me. And, and that's so important. And as men, guys, i got to tell us something. We don't get it on love. Most of us, I, I'd, gather, I'd gather there's not 10% of us in this room that even grew up with it, you know, that had a father who embraced us, who had a father that put his arms around us, who had a father that would, that would say, attaboy, had a father that showed up at your games and was there for you in important moments in your life, or was there to welcome you when you came back from overseas. You know, there's many of us in this room don't get it on fathers at all. So when you, when you try to read your Bible and you read our Father, that doesn't compute. Or if it computes, it's a negative. It's not a positive. Because your perception of that word is harsh, Absent, unloving, disconnected, uninvolved, punitive. These are some of the words that pop up in a lot of men when they think about their own fathers. 
So to get past that and see a God who is daddy, papa, loves you, wants to pull you into his arms, wants to be the one who holds you and carries you through your troubles and trials, who wants to dry the tears from your eyes, who wants to be there in the middle of the night when it's dark and you're by yourself and you wonder if you're going to get through this. We have a hard time relating to him that way. But I tell you something, if you'll open yourself to it, in spite of the way you perceive a father image right now, if you will open yourself to the idea and begin to pray, God, reveal yourself to me as a daddy. Be honest with God. Reveal yourself to me as a father. Reveal yourself to me as the lover of my soul. I know that's mushy for guys, but that's the heart of the matter. You remember when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest thing you can do? Remember that? Remember his answer? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. He put love at the center. And for men, that's like, oh, no, 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 no. We're better with lust than love. We're better with it's all about me than it is about somebody else. See, we're, we're better about the selfish stuff. So at the heart of your victory over trials, guys, we got to meet a God who is so loving and personal and, and begin to capture the fact that he really, really cares about us. That revelation has got to hit us if our attitude is going to get in the right place to deal with the trials. Now, here's a couple of passages. I, I looked at three of them that um, really spoke to me about trials because, and again, your trials could be different than mine. Mine isn't over, by the way. I'm halfway through the chemo process. You know, my doctors aren't telling me, man, you're healed, brother. You, you know, you're on your way. I get scanned again in a week or so, so I'll find out, you know, where tumor markers are and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not sitting here today as, you know, and, and say, I'm totally 100% healed and cured. I'm on the other side of disease and death. No, I'm in the middle of this thing. I'm smack dab in the middle of it. I don't have a clue what next week will be. Long range planning for me, well, I think Paul said he wanted to be done by nine. So that's long range planning. <laughs> you know, I have to laugh at some of my, I have to laugh at some of my church friends. You, know, you sit around the table with pastors and staff members and, well, what's the plan for the summer ministry and we're gonna do this? I said, brother, Come on. Let's get a plan for the next hour. You know, I mean, it, you know that, that's the way I'm living my life these days. But I'm finding it's so liberating. It's so liberating to stay in the now. I mean, I, I have to have some people around me that do plan, and I do. I've got a few great administrators that are thinking months down the road, and I need them. But uh, for me now, life is just in the... It's today... And I pray a simple prayer every day. Lord, I want to put a smile on your face today. And I want to put a smile on somebody else's face today. Because this is the only day I know that I'm living. By the way, it's the only day you know that you're living. Scripture says that. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day brings. There's not a man in this room. Physicians, doctors, surgeons, police chief. Doesn't matter who you are. Nobody in this room can say what, with 100% accuracy, You'll be alive tomorrow. You can't say that. You cannot say that with certainty. So even when the doctors say, you've got three months to live, oh, really? I've talked to a lot of people that have had the three-month-to-live thing 12 years ago, and they're still around. So, so you've you got you to get sobering about reality to realize God wants you to live your life now. Years ago, I heard a, a preacher say this. He said, too many people live crucified between two thieves. They're tied up because of yesterday or they're fearful about tomorrow. So what happens? If your life is still tugged with the pain and the disappointment and the heartache of yesterday or you're fearful about tomorrow, well, guess what's happening to today? It's blowing right by. You're missing today because yesterday still got you in its grip or you're afraid of what's coming tomorrow. And so this whole condition for me, guys, has said, Larry, Trust me for now. Trust me for this moment. Look at me as your heavenly daddy who can take care of business right now. 
Look at the next person I put in front of you and listen to see if I have some blessing I want to communicate through you to them. It's changed my perspective on things. But here's a couple of the, of the really kicker passages, I think. Romans 5 is uh, my favorite during this season. Is this blessing you guys? I, I, I mean, is it, is it connecting? It seems like I'm looking at your faces. I don't see you shutting down on me here, so this is, this is good. Um, Romans, Romans chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 is probably the theological Magna Carta of the New Testament. I mean, you will find out more about what Jesus did for you and how it's supposed to be in your life in chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 of Romans. I mean, that's the heart of the matter. That tells you what the cross accomplished. That tells you what faith is supposed to do. That gives you the, the, the essence of the struggle between your old life and your new life. And it, and it points to the victory that is unstoppable, that cannot be broken, that cannot be, death won't interfere with it, life won't interfere with it, angels can't mess with it, demons can't mess with it. You have a, you have a life that has been hidden in God through the cross. Those chapters, I commend them to you, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 of Romans. You get that content in your head, and you are theologically prepared to have a, a platform of faith to live your life. But in chapter 5, which kind of is unpackaging salvation, listen to this. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, he's telling us the results of the cross and our believing, we've got peace with God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then he goes on to say, well, that's good stuff. But then he says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. King James says we rejoice in our tribulations because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. You see, at just the right time, get this, guys, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And on and on it goes here. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still in sin, Christ died for us. You see, he took care of our business before we knew we had it. But the thing that is so compelling about this, as he talks about suffering, do you notice the word that he drops right in the middle of the text? You're suffering. You're going through stuff. You're under the squeeze. And, and, and the word in the Greek text for, for suffering or tribulation is the same word that, that describes the process of crushing grapes, thlipsis. It's that process of squeezing uh, something that is, that is, that is hard and, and bringing it down so the juice is useful for something. It's a squeeze. And so when we, when we talk about suffering, we talk about trials, we talk about tribulation, what we're really talking about is a squeeze play. God is allowing a squeeze to come on your life. Now, when the squeeze comes, one or two things is going to happen. You're either going to get bitter or you're going to get better. It's either going to have a negative effect that sends your attitude south. Or it's going to cause you to press into something that you can tap into, guys, and find you got hope. The big word here in chapter 5, in the middle of the suffering, is God isn't going to disappoint your hope. In other words, he's not going to let you down because he's going to supernaturally and anytime you see the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in the Bible, that's supernatural stuff. We don't control that. He does it. It says to us here, the love of God is poured, poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So get the picture. You're going through something that's horrible. You're feeling the squeeze play. That squeeze play is messing with your mind. It's messing with your attitude. It's messing with your whole belief system. You're questioning God. You're questioning yourself. You're questioning whether anybody has answers to anything. And suddenly in the middle of that, God says, this tribulation is producing patience. This patience is producing experience. This experience is producing hope. And hope's not going to disappoint you 
because right in the middle of it, when you're feeling the squeeze the worst, Papa pours his love in. <sighs> pours it in. It'd be great if it said he gets a little towel and he pats your forehead with it. It'd be super if he said he'll come alongside of you and hold your hand for five minutes. That would be good. But the scripture doesn't say that. It says he supernaturally, by the Spirit, pours. <sighs> pours. Get the picture of that. Pours. He hoses you down. You're getting hosed with heaven's love. In the middle of your worst stuff. In the middle of where you're feeling this, guys. And I can't tell you how many times I just cried out, God, I can't take this. For two months, guys, I couldn't even sleep in a bed. I'm sleeping in a chair. Because the fluid built up in the outside of my pleural cavity and my lung was such I couldn't lay horizontally. I was sleeping in my lazy boy. My wife would pack me in there at night with a, you know, put a sheet on it and a blanket, and then she'd go in the bedroom and weep because she saw, she saw me dying in front of her. She saw that ashen gray. I lost 47 pounds in two months. She saw me so weak I couldn't make it from the bedroom to the, to the bathroom without shuffling along. Mark saw me in my worst times. I mean, uh, we had some neat times together, but I mean, it was, you remember Mark, you, when you saw me today, I said, wow, because I hadn't seen him in a month. You know, you notice the difference, right? Big time. I mean, so, I mean, this thing took me low. Our church got scared. I mean, I, I, I'd come in, in on a wheelchair or come in with some guy helping me in, and the people were fearful. They'd go, our pastor's dying. My kids got that way. I got that way. I thought, this could be my last Christmas with my family. The whole family took it so seriously. All 19 of us <coughs> gathered, and I felt like the patriarch because I got to speak into everybody's, talk about getting rid of the fluff. Yeah. I'm telling you. I looked at my son-in-laws, I looked at my daughters, my older grandkids, and I said, you know, I want to say something that means something to my family. So Christmas was a time where old Poppy here did one-on-one -on -one with the whole family and just spoke some truth and love into everyone in my family. And, uh, you know, because, because it showed me the importance, because we've had friends who, you know, out there cutting their grass and they dropped dead with a heart attack, never got to say anything of, of final importance to their families. And so I had been cherishing the moments of saying, i got to say important stuff to people. You know, what if this does take me out? What if I do die soon? Do I want to leave anything unsaid with my wife? Do I want to leave uh, any heart, heartbreak uh, un, unresolved? Is there any people on the planet that I have offended, that I've not fixed things with? I don't want to leave bad stuff behind. And so it's, it's really put a desire in my heart to be right with God and right with people. But I'm convinced it's the hose play that did it. God hosed me down. He, he plumb turned the hose on me and poured his love in so ridiculously. I mean, the way I'm describing it right now, I am a victim of extravagant love. I'm a victim. God saw my suffering. He saw my condition. And he said, well... Best thing I can do for you, Larry. I'm going to fill you up with my love. You're going to be a love machine. You're going to go in restaurants, and they're going to know that somebody who loved Jesus was in the place. You're going to go in 7-Eleven, they're going to know, man, who was that guy? That's what he'll do for us. That's his promise. You realize there's not a thing that I read in there that said you had to do any of that other than believe. Your faith started it. Your faith opened the door for it. But the hose play is all God. The work of the Spirit is all Him. And, uh, and so in the midst of the worst stuff that can happen, He hoses us down with His love and convinces us. Because, guys, I never knew who my biological dad was. I had, my, you know, my mom was married, you know, to somebody that was not my biological dad. He was in there. He was the provider. But he, he was disengaged from my life, never went to my games, didn't even show up at my graduation. Um, but, you know, he provided for me, paid for my education, bought me a car when I went to college. Uh, I did reconcile with him before he died, but I, I never did find out the facts. I got my birth certificate and was, huh, what? You know, so, I mean, I live with the mystery of fatherlessness. And I'm telling you, that's what turned me into a rebel. 
That's what plunged me into the drug culture. That's what made me an anti-social hippie in the 60s because I thought I was ripped off, lied to. And so it took the hose approach for me. God had to hose me down with his love to actually believe it. And it's taken the squeeze play of suffering to get me receptive to that. Now, wouldn't you think by now, 65 years of age, 30 years in Christian ministry, I'd have figured that one out, considering Jesus said that's the number one thing. So you're not looking at an extremely intelligent person up here. <laughs> you know, it's taken me 30 years, 30 years, to figure out that the basic stuff of living for God has to do with love. Loving him, loving others. And you got to love yourself in there because, you know, Jesus said, and love your neighbor as. So you got you to deal with the messed up stuff in you. You know, we got to deal with our own dysfunction. We have to deal with our own scarring, our own wounding, our own fatherlessness. All that's in the love picture. But I'm telling you, gentlemen, as we do this, we're going to run into a level of joy in the Christian life that is beyond anything you can imagine. All right, how are we doing on time? We good? We good. Uh, well, I want to leave some time for questions, but um, let me tell you what the other passages are. We're not going to unpackage anything, but uh, one that is equally important, I think, is at the beginning of the book of James. Let me just read it real quick, because it's another one that doesn't make sense in the natural. I'll just read the one statement here. Consider it pure joy, brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish the work so that you may be mature, complete, and not lacking in anything. Now, that's probably one of the best statements in the Bible that tells you why God allows the squeeze play to come against your life. Because, um, gentlemen, I wish I could tell you you're going you're gonna to get to the place where you need to be in your life because you take a lot of classes and courses and have a good pastor and listen to good sermons and read good books. But I think ultimately, what's going to grow us up, what's going to mature us in our faith, is when God in his love allows the squeeze to come against our life. Because that's a test. Am I going to turn away from him? Or am I going to turn towards him? And... Uh, and I've met a lot of people who've turned away from him for years because uh, my, own, my own father, who was not biological, but he's the only guy I knew, when I got saved and I tried to win him to the Lord, you know, my mom died of cancer in her early 50s. I remember trying to, to get old Jack Booth to, to turn to Jesus, and, uh, and here's what he said with anger. I'm not interested in a God who killed your mother with cancer. That's, that's my first recollection of how cancer affected somebody. My mom's husband. I'm not interested in a God who killed your mother. Now, you think he was happy? He was blaming God for illness and death. That's, that's, that, and there's some of us that do stuff like that. I mean, we actually want to pin the label on God for this stuff. But that's not a healthy place to stay. And if any of us happen to be there, uh, we really do need to get under the hose. We really need to get to that place where we can just, you know, let God do what, he, do what he what He has to do. But I asked a man years ago when I was just young and idealistic. I heard a seminary professor do a lecture on Christian growth and maturity, and the man who was doing the lecture was dying of cancer at the time. The seminary professor, and um, subsequently, within a few months of him talking to our group, did die. I went up to him during the break, and I said, "Dr. Thompson, I have a question for you." Is it possible to live the kind of Christian life you're talking about? A yielded, surrendered life with Jesus in the center of everything without going through suffering. He looked at me, tears formed in his eyes, and he said, Larry, I don't think so. That's all he said. I never forgot that. That was probably 1978. He said, I don't think so. I don't think because we, guys, we have such a tough skin such an outer hardness of wanting to control everything in our lives. It really takes the squeeze to get us to start releasing things to God. We just don't do it voluntarily. We just, 
I mean, we'll do it to a level. I'm sure everybody in here, you know, we've done stuff. But we don't get to the place where you get hosed. You don't get the love hose. Just throwing your cigarettes on the altar. Well, I'm going to quit smoking. That's a good thing to do, by the way. Quit smoking. That's, that's for somebody in here. And I'm not a prophet. That's for somebody. You know, quit smoking. You know. I mean, that, that's a good step, but that's not the end. You know, God wants the whole deal. He wants the whole deal. So I leave you with this. You've got, you've got to make a choice somewhere along the way. And, and my, my uh, ultimate verse that I've been praying into pretty much every day is found in Psalm 84. And, and it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue of resolve. Uh, because each of us has got to make a determination how we're, going to, how we're going to live our life. I mean, we really do. We've got to nail this thing down. But, but in this passage in Psalm 84, I'll read two, a couple of verses to you. Blessed are those whose strength is in the Lord. And the, the NIV translation get, catches this for me. Who have set their heart on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of suffering, they turn it into a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each one appears before God in Zion. Now, that passage has blessed me for the simple reason I have found a number of scripture passages that talk about setting your heart. Now, setting your heart is like setting a GPS. I mean, most of us have GPSs on our phones. Uh, once you set a course, if you have a boat, uh, you know, and you're going out to a fishing spot, uh, you know, Paul could tell us about that. You know, you, you program in your GPS coordinates, right? And, and your, your boat's headed in that direction. And, and if, you're, if, you're, if your equipment's good, you know, you can be out there in the ocean. It looks like the vast big old blue sea. But that GPS, if it's accurate, that's popping you plumb over that fishing spot. You are there. You are right there. Those coordinates have, have, have brought your boat right where it needs to be because you set the equipment to take you someplace. This scripture is saying, I have set my heart on pilgrimage with God. In other words, I'm journeying with him till I get to the finish line. That's something that each of us has got to do. We have to do that. Nobody else can do that for us. I've got to set my heart on something. I've got to determine as a man that my bottom line is, Jesus, you're running this thing. And I'm setting my heart on looking at you, on following you, and on walking this journey called living until I get to the end game. And that's the end game until each one of us appears before God. Wow. That's determination. So that doesn't matter what happens to me. Quite frankly, this hose play that God's worked on me, he stripped fear away from me. I'm not afraid of cancer. In fact, I'm bulletproof until God's done with me. Chief, you could pull your gun out and try to shoot me right now, but uh, it wouldn't be a good idea. But, uh, but honestly, I really believe that. I really believe I'm bulletproof until God's done with me, that I could be in some chaotic event with some guy with an Uzi spraying, you know, spraying a crowd in a theater. Bullets could fly everywhere. I'm not going to die until God says I am. He's got the order on my life. The Bible says before I lived one day in my life, written in his book, right? From the first to the last. So I've settled the matter on who's, who's in charge of my last heartbeat. Who's in charge of my pulse? Not a disease. The disease isn't in charge of me. God's in charge of me. Now that, that's taken a set. I've had to set my heart on that. And the last four months of my life have caused that to happen. And uh, I'm just crazy right now. And, and I don't want to get uncrazy. I want to stay in the hose down mode. Because I tell you why, guys. The church has so misrepresented Jesus. We've made him a wimp or we've made him a distant God who's not involved with the people. And somehow, each of us has to represent the reality of who a resurrected Christ is. And, and I tell you, when he hoses us down, we're going to look more like him than like ourselves. So let me pray over you and we might have some Q&A here. 
And then I know Paul wants to wrap things up. Okay? Good? Did, received? All right. Lord, I thank you for these men. I thank you, God, that each man in this room is on a journey, on a pilgrimage. And Lord, uh, each guy here has got to make some choices on how they're going to handle the squeeze play. Because it is coming. It is either on somebody right now, it's coming, or they just got through it, or they're still wrestling with the results of it. Uh, God, help us get to the place where we can set our hearts on you and set our hearts on a journey that is only looking in one direction. And that's towards you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul? Yeah. Um, if everyone can just hang tight for just two minutes, and uh, Larry, don't go anywhere. Okay. Um, wow. Oh, one thing, Paul, I forgot. Um, two books were slipped into my hands early in this cancer journey. Uh, my wife gave me this one for Christmas, and uh, a dear friend sent me this in the mail, but... Uh, if any of you have friends or family that are dealing uh, with uh, terminal illness right now, these little books right here have been very encouraging. One's called Cancer and the Lord's Prayer, Hope and Healing Through History's Greatest Prayer. Great little book. And uh, this is one my wife gave me, which is a daily devotional where you actually write stuff down. Your Journey with God Through Cancer, 365 Daily Devotions in Journal and Beyond. Tremendous book on dealing with tests, suffering, trials. And uh, these little things you can put in somebody's hand and really, really encourage somebody. Okay?